Hello friends, I feel a little bit silly dressed up for Easter on a Wednesday uh, here at the church more or less by myself, but I, I wanted to do what I could to mark it out as special because today is the day that gives birth to all of our other days. Even locked down and scattered across Baltimore City and elsewhere, let's, let's let Easter infect our spirits with some of its promise and some of its joy. If you haven't already read uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, just press pause on me uh, right now and read Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. I'll be teaching from the NLT version, so it might be best to read it in that version. And once you've read it, you can press play again. I'm sure one of the first things you noticed was just how abrupt this ending was, like really abrupt. And depending upon what Bible you were reading from or what software you were reading from, you might have noticed that there are a bunch of uh, additional longer endings to Mark's gospel. We're not gonna get bogged down in this this morning, but I wanna say enough that this isn't a splinter in your mind. Quite early on in the life of the church, uh, these other longer endings uh, began to circulate, presumably as an attempt to make sense of this abrupt short ending. What we have, what you just read, verses 1 through 8, uh, are widely held to be the original, the authoritative ending of Mark. It could, of course, be that um, Mark had a, a longer ending that didn't end quite so abruptly uh, that's been lost to us, or it could be that, you know, he had two more paragraphs to go and accidentally slipped and hit the send key or, or died or something like that before it was totally finished. But uh, there's no use spending much time speculating about all of that. Uh, verses one through eight are what we understand to be original and authoritative, and that's why that's what we are focusing on this morning. It's an interesting episode, isn't it? it? It begins with the experience of these three women, which I love, by the way. It's so fitting in keeping with Jesus' character, who's been inclusive of women and others all along, that it's three women who discover the empty tomb. So these, these women are grappling with their grief, and, and to be you know, bald about it, they're really just trying to make sure that Jesus' corpse doesn't stink too badly. So on the Saturday night, they make these plans, they go out and they purchase spices, and uh, it turns out they've forgotten the one key thing. So on Sunday morning, they head out with their spices, having forgotten that this tomb is sealed with a giant boulder. But when they arrive, miraculously, wonderfully, the stone has been rolled away, and they go into the tomb through, uh, there's like this little antechamber at the front, and beyond that is the slightly larger room where the bodies were laid out on these low stone benches or carved out of the rock. And they get the fright of their lives because instead of finding the body of their Lord dead, they instead find a very live messenger sitting there. And he's sitting in kind of the ancient position of authority and teaching. And so authoritatively, this angel messenger says to them, don't be afraid, which, as you know from the ending of this, apparently was not powerful enough to make them not fear just on the strength of him saying it. But he goes on, Jesus is not here. He's risen. He's risen. This, this single dynamite stick of a word in the, the original uh, Greek. He is risen. Now go. Go and tell the disciples and, and Peter, by the way, who had canceled Jesus three times on the night of his execution. Go and tell the disciples and Peter to go, go to Galilee. Jesus has gone ahead of you there. You'll see him there just as he promised. And then this passage ends almost like with the sound of, of fleeing footsteps. We are told that the women flee in terror and say nothing to anyone. In our journey through uh, Mark's telling of the life of Jesus, as far as I can recall, every teaching has been on an episode that includes Jesus. And one of the odd things about this episode is that Jesus isn't in it to be seen anywhere which of course is uh, largely the point, but maybe not only in the way that you're hearing it. 
I mean, obviously, tombs are for dead people, and, uh, and Jesus is very much alive, so that when, when the women go to the, the tomb, he's not there anymore, and this is telling us by the absence of Jesus in the tomb, this is evidence to us that he has been raised from the dead, but, but there's more, I think, going on there. The fact that Jesus doesn't appear here in the, the ending of the story that's been all about him is, is pointing, I think, to, to Mark's command, or to the command of the angel, to the, to the women, go and tell. In this very last episode, the followers of Jesus, as it were, are being invited to play a fuller role. They're being invited up onto the stage. Now, just to be clear, for, for this whole breathtaking story of the life of Jesus, 16 chapters in Mark, Jesus alone has been the hero, like the spotlight has been on him alone from chapter one when his cousin was baptizing him and the heavens opened and the spirit of God came down on him and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, you bring me great joy. And it's only Jesus, only Jesus who never grasps after power but still is able to resist and to defeat Satan. It's, it's only Jesus who assumes the role of Isaiah's picture of God's servant who suffers on behalf of all of his people. It's, it's only Jesus who dies on a cross and, and carries the, the curse for all of our rebellion against God and all of our wretchedness towards one another. It's only Jesus who makes it possible for us to be forgiven. It's only Jesus who is raised from death to life again in a body that will never, ever die. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus being the king of this kingdom that he is announcing, where, where uh, he is renewing people in the image of God. That's what his healings and, uh, and exercising demons is at least partly about. It's, it's all about uh, Jesus teaching his followers that to be the greatest actually means to be the least, to become the servant of all, as he uh, calls himself in chapter 10. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's all about Jesus, who is the King, who is the long-awaited Messiah, and actually who's far, far more than that, who is God in the flesh. He is squarely the hero of this story. But even from the start, this story has been about him inviting people, people like you and like me, to trust in him, to come to be with him, to become like him, to learn from him, and to participate with him in what he's doing. And so this whole story has been about his journey with his disciples, about his patience with them as they've uh, been slow to learn. It's about his patience with them unpacking the parables for them in private. It's about uh, him teaching them with the example of his life. It's about him uh, watching excruciatingly as they are slow to see what long shots like the Syrophoenician woman and the Roman centurion have seen uh, much more clearly than they. It's, a, it's about him uh, giving them learning opportunities. And here, at the, the very close of Mark's telling of the life of Jesus, it's about him inviting them to participate. See, the message of the kingdom of God and of its king, King Jesus, needs to be proclaimed. The, the incredibly good news that Jesus comes to us offering us rescue and salvation and forgiveness of sins and eternal life and hope and healing in him, this incredibly good news needs to be shared. And who better to do that than, than people like the disciples, people like those women, people like you and me who fumblingly and failingly along the way have nonetheless experienced God's power and grace in our own lives firsthand. Who better to share the good news that he is 
alive again. So though verse 8 ends with the women saying nothing to anyone, we know that they did in fact say something, right? Because this story is being read for the first time. Its original audience is, uh, is a little house churches in Rome, which was the city, by the way, which uh, by extension had authorized Jesus' execution. It's Jewish believers in Jesus and Gentile believers in Jesus and enslaved people and free people and women and men gathered together in little clusters in homes in Rome worshiping Jesus on Sunday all because they had heard and believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. In a way then this final episode in Mark's telling of the life of Jesus is is a little bit like all other uh, Jesus' mighty deeds in Mark's gospel. It shows us something of Jesus' identity. Like, this really is God in the flesh. Who, other than the creator, can overcome death with life? But it's also leveling a question at our hearts. And I think this is the question that this episode levels at us. Will you be silent out of fear? Will you be silent out of fear or, or facing the fear even with a smidge of faith? Will we step out? Will we proclaim with our words and with our lives the good news of Jesus? Followers of Jesus, let's just be clear, aren't people who are never afraid. In fact, it's often in the most fearful circumstances that God leads us into our greatest faithfulness to him. Remember those friends of the paralyzed man back in chapter four? Don't you think they were afraid? Like, what if this doesn't work? What if we drop him? What if this goes wrong? Or the Syrophoenician woman in chapter seven, what will people think if I approach this man and interact with him? It's always in these circumstances of elevated fear where God leads his people into our deepest faithfulness. It was was only actually after the, the first followers of Jesus in Jerusalem began to experience persecution after one of them, Stephen, had been killed in Acts chapter seven. It was only then that they stepped up in faith and dispersed out of the comfort and safety of Jerusalem to share the good news of the crucified and now risen King Jesus. St. Mose, we trust and are learning to trust in the only true living God. He is the creator of the world. He did become human. He lived sinlessly among us as one of us. He suffered at our hands, was put to death at our hands, and died for our sakes. And he was raised again, never to die, in a body that cannot die. And that same God, the God we see most clearly in Jesus, is inviting us. It's inviting you. It's inviting me. Even today, in the midst of a global pandemic, even today in a moment that none of us really understand yet how to operate well in, Even today, he's inviting us to participate with us in sharing with other, participate with him in sharing with others the good news about Jesus. Are you up for it? Are we up for it? We don't have to pretend that we have no fear. But he invites us to trust that the things we are most afraid of, he has gone before us into and has already defeated on our behalf. Could we be like these three women? Could we be like the disciples who just days before had abandoned Jesus? Could we be like those Jerusalem Christians in Acts chapter 8 who decided that even greater than our fear is the worth of King Jesus and the joy of joining him in bringing his love to all the world. Will you join me? Father, we thank you for the incredible news that Jesus is alive. 
We pray that even today, by the Spirit of Jesus who is alive, by your Spirit with us in our scattered locations, that you would give us the gift of faith, that you would give us the gift of courage, and that you would provide us, even in these new circumstances of COVID-19, provide us with opportunities to share what we know of the goodness and love of the resurrection of Jesus. Would you provide us opportunities to share the good news of the King who offers us forgiveness and salvation in him? Father, would you equip us for what you have invited us to participate with you in? We pray this in the name of Jesus, because he's alive, because we trust in him. Amen.